All right, I'd like to start things on time. Uh, so we are right here at 3 o'clock. So thank you guys all for getting here on time. I know we'll have people kind of rolling in late. We're not going to give these guys a hard time, but the next ones we will. Um, my name is Jeff Blankenberg. I work for Amazon on the Alexa team. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you guys today about Alexa, how it works, how the pieces fit together, um, how, you th how you should think about um, software development when you build things for Alexa. Uh, because I think it's a little bit different than anything I've ever done before. I started out as a web developer primarily in the marketing world. Um, so I got to build websites for a lot of big brands and uh, big companies. And uh, then I kind of moved on, did a little consulting, and spent some time at Microsoft for about nine years. Um, and then uh, just recently joined, joined Amazon about two years ago. And so in those two years, when I got to Amazon, I wasn't hired because I was some expert in voice and understanding how a user communicates with a computer. That wasn't something there were a lot of experts in. Um, but I understood how to write software, and I understood Node and JavaScript, and uh, I was especially proficient at things like user interfaces. How do I build something that effectively um, allows a user to interact with our software? And so voice is a natural extension of that if you're kind of an advocate for your users when you think about building software. Uh, and so that's kind of how I, I ventured into all of this. Um, and this is kind of where I've landed. So one of the things that I like to do, I like to make this a little interactive, although these lights are phenomenally bright, so I can't see you all very well. Um, so I'm just going to have you guys yell out to me uh, when you know the answers. But we're going to start with a little interactive quiz. Um, and then once we've done the quiz, we'll get into some, some interesting stuff about, again, uh, how Alexa works, how people talk to it, how, what, what happens in that life cycle from when a user speaks till uh, my code can do something. Um, so uh, first, I want to thank all of you for coming, though. This, is, uh, this should be informative. And <clears throat> before anything else, um, there's also a workshop tomorrow. If you want to get your hands dirty and actually build something for Alexa, I'm going to be running a workshop tomorrow morning. I think it's at 10.40. Um, and so if you'd like to join me for that, uh, we'll cover a little bit of this, but it's going to be mostly hands-on coding kind of stuff. So with that, um, one of the things that I like to ask people is if anyone knows where Alexa devices are available. Um, so Alexa itself can be used anywhere. I, I brought this to Norway. works just fine. Um, but there aren't devices sold here. Um, <clears throat> I have to go to some other country. So we're going to do a quick quiz, and this is going to test your geography skills. Does anyone know what country this is? You can just yell it out. They're going to get harder. It's the United, America, United States, right. Um, very good. How about this one? UK, good, go good job. Uh, how about this one? Canada, it's sometimes referred to as America's hat. Um, so it sits right up on top. Uh, but yeah, that's Canada, correct? How about this one? Japan. Japan. Man, you guys are much better at this than Americans. Uh, we only know the one country. Uh, so that's Japan. India, very good. Australia, wow, you guys are really good at this. Uh, how about this one? France, right? Uh, this is a relatively new one. We just launched in France last week. Um, so that's really new. It now supports the French language, which is exciting. Um, how about this one? What did you say? Uh, you would think it's Germany. It's actually Groot. Um, no, it's Germany. That's correct. Um, good job. Um, and there's actually a, 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 this is the list of like the places we support with the native languages and things like that. So you'll see that in Japan, we support Japanese. In, in Germany, we support German. In France, we spend, uh, support French. We don't support any of the languages in India yet. Uh, but my hope is that we'll be able to support that uh, in the near future. Uh, and then the other ones uh, that you see there in English. But it is also available to purchase and run in English in all of these other countries as well. And so there's a, a long, long list, and we're continuing to grow this um, as we go. And so this, we'll hope that this list will continue to grow uh, much more over, the, over time. However, as a developer, as someone that writes software, you can build software for Alexa, something we call a skill, um, anywhere in the world. You, you don't have to be in one of those countries to write software for these. You don't have to be in these countries to write software for a user in the United States or a user in Japan or a user in India. Um, you're more than capable of doing that from anywhere. Um, and so I just want to make sure that there's that important distinction, that even though we're not currently in a country where the devices are sold, that doesn't mean that you can't write software that people all over the world could use. So let's talk a little bit about where we've been and, and where we're going. Um, for those of you that have uh, the indication of age like I do, um, you may recall when the only thing you could do with a computer was type to it. That was the only way to communicate. You didn't even have the mouse. 
It was all command line based stuff. You didn't have a GUI or anything like that. Um, and you were just executing commands against the computer and it would do the things that you asked to or tell you that your syntax was wrong. Uh, then we graduated into things like Windows and Mac where we had this graphical user interface and you could take a mouse and you could move it around the screen and you could click on things and it was still the same idea, right? I was still executing a lot of those same commands but I was doing it in a, in a visual way which was much more accessible to people that didn't know how to use DOS or, or Linux or something like that. So what's really cool about the graphical user interface is that that's kind of when I really got into computers. I mean, I, I had used com DOS based computers and things like that as a kid um, but it, it was about when I was in high school that a lot of that stuff came out and was really usable. And in, in when I was doing that, um, I was talking with my grandmother, telling her about some of the cool stuff I was doing, some games I was playing. And uh, she says, wow, that sounds pretty cool. My grandmother at the time was probably in her mid to late 60s. Uh, she goes, you know, you might be able to help me. I have all of these recipe cards that I handwrite for all the recipes, I, my, my grandmother's a fantastic cook, um, and she has all these recipes, and her friends are constantly asking, them for, asking her for them. So she'll take the one that she has, and she'll sit down on a, like a three by five card, and she'll write out the, the other copy of it, and then she'll give the copy to someone else. Uh, and she goes, could I type those out? I, I've considered using a typewriter, but it's just as much work, if not more. Uh, and I said, yeah, we, I'm sure there's some recipe software we could find, um, so let's get that, let's get you set up with a computer, we can do the whole thing. So I got her a computer, right, the big gray rectangular box that sat on her desk uh, with a monitor that sits on top uh, and the mouse and the keyboard and everything. And I got this software set up for her and everything was installed and I said, okay, what you wanna do is sit down here at the computer and I want you to click on that icon right there that says um, recipe software, I don't remember the name of what it was. Uh, and she reached out to the screen and she touched it. This was 1984. Um, we didn't have a lot of touch screens at that point, um, but it was very surprising to me, and it's always kind of stuck with me, that that was her go-to reaction, was to touch the screen. She hadn't really used a computer before, uh, certainly a mouse, and so I had to explain to her the mouse is kind of a proxy for the thing on the screen, and you move it around, and the thing moves on the screen, and she eventually got it. It was, it was pretty clear once I showed her. Um, but now, if you look at where we've gone, we've, we've made software local on a computer, then we've taken that same software and made it accessible and distributed everywhere, so you don't have to install it with things like the web. Uh, and then we had the advent of mobile, right? Where now, and I don't think anyone really appreciates the fact, do you guys appreciate what you have in your pocket? Like, it is remarkable. You have the entirety of human knowledge just in your pocket, no big deal. Uh, I, no one seems to appreciate the, that the way I do. Uh, anyway. So when we got to mobile, now we have this device that we can touch and drag and swipe and zoom and do all these kinds of things. And now you see videos, good or bad, of one-year-olds, infants, being able to interact with a computer. If I set, if I set a one-year-old down with a keyboard and a mouse, I guarantee they're not gonna get anything done. Uh, but with a tablet, they can sit down, they can pinch, they can zoom. I actually saw a really sad video of a child that was handed a photo album. Uh, and it was pictures of their family and everything, and they opened it up, and they saw a picture of them with their mom and dad, and they did this on a printed photo, uh, hoping to make it larger. Um, that makes me a little sad, but uh, that's the, the nature of the environment we live in today. And so as we've grown through all of this, all of these are building towards more accessibility. How do we make this easier for users to use of all um, abilities and um, understanding and age. And we really feel like voice, it's kind of the first way you interact with anyone. I mean, the first time you ever interacted with another person, you were probably screaming or crying. You were using your voice. You weren't using sign language. You weren't, you weren't um, doing anything else other than probably trying to communicate with your voice. And this becomes kind of the, the most natural way for people to be able to communicate. Certainly, it takes a little time as we're, as we're growing to learn how to speak, how to use the right words. Uh, but that's something most people have mastered by three, um, to be able to have at least a limited vocabulary. And so the idea that we can use voice to communicate with a computer, to communicate what we want and how we want it, um, this has become, for me, like the really exciting part of all this. Um, because there are people that don't have hands, right? How are they going to use a tablet? Um, or at least not easily, right? There's lots of accessibility for things like that, but it's pretty hard. Uh, but anyone that has a voice can now communicate with a computer. 
which is a big, big deal, especially for communities like the blind, where they couldn't interact with a device that had a screen because they can't see the screen. Um, so being able to now accomplish tasks just by talking into the air, something they've always been able to do, uh, is empowering. Uh, and we see that a lot, not only in assisted living homes, where uh, people are a little older or maybe aren't comfortable with technology like an iPad, um, but they're, they've discovered that it's very, very easy to speak with their voice. Uh, and the blind community has found a way to play electronic games for almost the first time, where now they can sit down and they can talk to a device um, and they can have an interactive adventure game that they wouldn't really have been able to do very easily before. So voice in our minds represents the next big evolution in computing. Um, it's going to be the, the next way. It's not going to replace. I don't think any of those things that you saw on my list uh, were replaced. I, can, I still use a command line every day. Um, but if you look at how we start interacting with computers, voice is going to be that next thing. You're going to walk into a hardware store and ask where the hammers are, and it's going to say, oh, the hammers are in aisle 9. And when you get to aisle 9, it'll tell you how to get even closer. But without having to interact with a person that may or may not be able to help you, or um, it's, it's making things easier to manage and handle. So I mentioned earlier that the software that you write for Alexa, uh, for, for uh, for Amazon Alexa devices is called a skill. There's about 30,000 or so of them, and that list continues to grow every day. There's lots of very good ones from games to interaction. I can order a pizza. I can order an Uber. Um, all of those things I can, be, can be done just with my voice. And it's really empowering to just say, i got to make sure this is muted, uh, Alexa, get me an Uber. Uh, and then it says, hey, there will be a car at your house in 15 minutes. Like, that's really powerful, right? I don't want to have to pull my phone out and open the app and find the thing and have it find my location. It already knows all of that stuff. Just get me a car. That's all I really wanted. So that's the idea behind skills, is that these are the, the apps of the voice world. So let's get into how these things really work, because I think this is the, the really interesting, important stuff. So there's two sides, like there is with most software, right? If you build a website, you've got a front end and a back end. If you build a mobile app, you've got a front end and a back end. This, this is a common paradigm we see with most software. Um, and with voice, it's the same way. We have a voice user interface, which is the way that uh, people will interact and, and talk to your device. Um, and this is, the, this is the really important stuff, I think, and this is what we're going to talk about today. The, the other side, the programming logic, is the same thing that you've done everywhere else, right? I know that I need to perform some action. I have some function. I need to do a thing. I'm going to write some code to do that, and then I'm going to respond back to the front end and let it know that this thing has changed. So the, the back end, although I'll talk about it briefly, um, isn't actually that interesting. It's just the same programming that we've done over and over and over. What I think is really interesting is this voice user interface and how do we get um, a user's voice all the way to my code to go do a thing. So they live in two different places. And this, this slide is slightly misleading. Um, on the left-hand side, we have developer.amazon.com. This is the place that you go to build your voice user interface. Um, this is where you define the things that your skill can and can't do. Um, and how people would communicate with your, um, your code to be able to do that. And then I say the programming logic is at aws.amazon.com, but realistically, the back end of your code, the back end of your skill can live literally anywhere. As long as you have an HTTPS connection and you can consume and send JSON, it doesn't matter where it lives. Um, you can put it on AWS. We have a service called Lambda, but if you'd rather run that off the server that's sitting under your desk, that's also fine as long as you meet those requirements. So um, that's the, the structure. We have a front end and a back end. But how this stuff actually works, I think, is cool. And th th this slide is one of my favorites. So the first thing that happens is the user speaks, and that's what you see on the left-hand side. And it goes into their device, which is up here. And the first thing it does, this is kind of a, just a geeky hardware thing I like to talk about. Um, but we have two pieces that happen here. One is on the device, there's uh, some software running called the wake word engine. And what happens with the wake word engine is it's listening and it's tuned to only hear one word. So it's not, it's not listening in the sense that you have a microphone in your house that can just hear all your words. It's trained to only activate when it um, is presented with one specific word. Um, in, in my case, mine is uh, using the word Alexa. But if you want to change it to be Amazon or Echo um, or computer, uh, any of those words will work as well. But again, you have to pick one of them, and only that one will work. Um, and then the, the other cool part about this is that there's this idea of beam forming. Now, this is a loud room. Um, there's, there's background noise. There's a bunch of other stuff going on. But this usually works pretty well. So I'm going to try and demonstrate this. Um, so I have a device here. 
And there are six microphones mounted around the outside of this device, and then there's one in the middle, so there's seven total. And the, the way this is generally meant to use is it's meant to be set on a table like this. So I'm hoping most of you can see the top of this device. I'll, I'll bring it a little forward so you can see it. Um, I'm going to walk over here. Alexa, can you guys see how there's a blue ring, but there's also a light lit part that's pointing right at me? And if I walk over here... Which phone number, contact, Hello? or device do you want to call? Stop. If I'm over here, Alexa, you can see that now it's pointing to me over here. So this concept is called beamforming. Alexa, stop. Um, this concept is called beamforming. What it's doing is it's taking those seven microphones, and it's recognizing where it heard the wake word, which microphone heard my voice best, and then it takes the other six mics and it uses the information that those are capturing to cancel all of the noise that those other six microphones hear and only focus in on what I'm saying. So this makes it really nice when I'm in the kitchen and I say, Alexa, I want to order some more paper towels from Amazon. And my son goes, and 100,000 Legos too. Um, it doesn't hear him because he's not in the direction that I was speaking. Um, now, it can hear him, of course, if, if there's... Um, walls bouncing sound. A lot of people like to put these like in a corner of their kitchen. Um, and sometimes the beam forming doesn't work necessarily as well because it has uh, two walls bouncing sound into it from the sides as well. And so it, it won't always know exactly where you are. But for the most part, in an open room like this, uh, it works quite well. So that's wake word detection and beam forming. Um, now we're getting into how this thing actually works. So once the wake word engine wakes up and it says, oh my gosh, they want to tell me something, and it starts recording, real recording with a microphone, um, the words that you say. And it just takes that audio file and it ships it off to this cloud, the, the Amazon Alexa cloud. Um, and it does a few things against this. The first is that it does speech to text. So it takes the audio that you have and it, com it translates that down to actual text words that are the words that you spoke. This is, uh, there's a whole science behind this. There's a concept called phonemes. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the, the idea of phonemes, but the, they're smaller than syllables. It's each individual sound you make when you speak. And it takes the waveform, the audio file, and it matches that against the phonemes for the library you subscribe to. So the phonemes for French are different than the phonemes for German, than the di are different for US English versus UK English. Each of them have their own set of phonemes. And it maps those down to a specific set of words. And then it takes those words and travels over to our uh, machine learning and natural language understanding. So we use machine learning first. Machine learning is the idea that we compare what you said to what anyone has ever said to look for patterns, right? How does this map to what other people have tried to do in the past? And then we get down to natural language understanding, which is a really important concept in all this, which is to understand not just the words that you said, but the meaning of the words that you said. Quick example of that, if you've ever been in a relationship you know that the words you say are not always the words you mean, right? So the same, the same idea applies here in that we're looking for that actual meaning. Uh, an example I would like to use is if you ask Alexa, what's it like? There's no real words in that sentence. What's it like? But I think most of you, if I were to walk up to you on the street and say, what's it like? You would tell me what the weather is or what the weather's going to be, right? Most people kind of infer that meaning based on what they think other people might have said in the past, right? We're using our own machine learning engine. And so those things all happen, and we boil it down to what we call an intent. So the intent is a thing you define in your voice user interface that says, these are the things that I do. So if your skill was a DVD player, you might have a play intent, a pause intent, a rewind intent, a stop intent. Each one of those is a thing that the user might want to do. And when they say something like play, or it's movie time, or whatever, um, in any of those cases, those things translate to my play intent. So if they say anything that resembles play, it's going to go to play. If they say anything that resembles stop, or quit, or cancel, or um, exit, um, those all might translate to my stop intent. Um, and if I say back up, or rewind, or go back 10 seconds, um, that would be my rewind intent, right? And so as they say these things, we start mapping statements against the individual intents that we offer until we have a wide array of things that our skill does. And sometimes that's just a few things. You might have something very simple. Um, I, uh, I'm a big American baseball fan, and so I built a skill called Games Back, and the only thing that this skill does is tell, tells me um, what the standings are for the team that I ask for. 
So it just tells me, are they in first place? And if they're not in first place, how many games back from first place are they? Um, so let me, I'll demonstrate that very quickly. Alexa, open games back. I can tell you how many games back your favorite baseball team is. Which team would you like to know about? The Indians. The Cleveland Indians are currently in first place in the American League Central with a record of 35 and 30. The Minnesota Twins are in second place, five games back behind the Indians. Which team would you like to know about next? Stop. Goodbye. So you can see there were a couple of things that happened there. First, I opened the skill, but I didn't give it any commands or anything, and it went into what we call a launch request. The launch request is when they just want to open the skill, and it says, hey, I'm the skill. Here's some things I can do. After that, I don't know if it's going to respond or not. Um, after that, it asked me what team I wanted, and I told it the name of a team, but I just said the mascot, right? I could have said the city. I could have said the mascot. I could have said a combination of them, or a lot of teams have um, nicknames. You guys have probably all heard of the New York Yankees. Um, some people call them the Yanks. Uh, the pinstripers, those are all nicknames for that team. And so if you say those things, it also is able to recognize those because I've added those as um, metadata to, the, to the values that I have in my utterances. So in each of these cases, um, I was able to tell it what team I wanted, it recognized the team, and then it was able to tell me what's going on with that team. But that's the extent of that skill. I could really just tell you about a team, and that's the only kind of commands that that skill takes. Um, we can get into much more advanced examples. I'll show you a little bit later where I'm building a trivia game, and you can start a quiz, and you can answer questions, and you can ask about a category, and you can buy stuff. There's all sorts of other things you can do, uh, and I'll demonstrate that here in a little while. But the idea here right now is that we have these concepts of intents. These are the things, the constructs that we have in our voice UI that allow us to say, I'm going to do this thing, or I'm going to do this thing. And if you're a pizza skill, right, you, you let people order pizzas, you probably don't also play music. Right? So it's unlikely that someone in your skill is going to say, oh, and also play the Beatles um, if they're in the middle of ordering a pizza. So you don't have to have a play music intent unless that's something you really want to offer. Maybe you're that unique pizza shop that likes to play music while people order their pizza. I don't, I don't know what your, what your business is about, uh, but that's something you certainly could do, but it just doesn't seem like those two really go together. Okay, so how did all this become possible? Over the last four or five years, what we've been able to do, not we, but like the industry as a whole, has been able to really ramp up the ability to understand human spoken language. Um, and without this capability, without this momentum, and being able to recognize a large percent of words that are spoken reliably, um, devices like the Echo and the Google Home and all of these devices wouldn't be capable of existing. The, this ramp up, this, this thing that we're seeing here on the screen, this is why all of these devices exist now. Uh, is because we now have the software, we have the technology to be able to recognize words reliably. So let's talk about how we do some of these things. So I mentioned earlier with our utterances and our intents, how we kind of take this idea and we translate it down to a set of clues. We have, we have a, a set of sample utterances maybe for each iterant, uh, for each intent that says, hey, I want, when they say play, if they say any of these things, that's play, right? We have these, this training data. So what do we do in situations like this where what the user said could have four or five meanings? So in this case, I know I'm Americanizing myself here, um, but if someone says four miles, four miles could mean a distance, right? But it could also mean my son's name is Miles. It could also mean that I'm buying a gift for him, right? So I'm going to get something four miles. Those sound exactly the same. Or let's say we're doing a, a unit on um, volcanoes in school, and we talk about how they four miles, right? Sounds exactly the same. Or let's say I'm a really rich guy with a yacht, and I need to buy some stuff for my aisles, right? In each of these cases, that really sounds very similar, and it would be very hard for Alexa to be able to figure out just looking at the, the sounds that you said to be able to translate that down to a specific set of words. So by building out these intents and building the utterances and another concept called slots that we'll get to in a little while, by building all of this stuff together, what we're able to do is give Alexa enough contextual hints to say, oh, it's probably this one. I'm looking for a distance, so it's probably four miles. Um, or I'm looking for a person's name, so it's probably four miles uh, the person's name. 
So how does all this stuff work together? Because there's, we, we generally think about building for voice by um, not asking the user to say it in a specific way. The, the idea behind voice is to allow a user to say it the way they would say it, uh, in the way they would say it, in the order of words they would say it. Um, but there are a couple of rules you have to follow to talk to a device like this. The first is, in order to wake it up, you have to say the wake word, which is Alexa in this case. And then, as you saw with Games Back, I had to say open Games Back. And so in this case, I'm building a skill called Oslo Guide. It might be a, a cool tourist thing to tell you about the palace and some other cool things to go see. Um, so I say open Oslo Guide, and it says, OK, here's Oslo Guide. Here are some things you might want to check out or know about. Um, the word open is not anything that I have to worry about at all. Um, the user, there's a list of about 20 different words that a user can use, but they could use things like start or launch or begin or resume um, or tell. Uh, one that I'm working on this trivia game, I want people to say, um, ask TKO trivia to start a game or to start a quiz, right? And by doing things like that, by saying ask, it gets them right to the place they want to be. These words, though, they don't actually have any meaning. They're just a trigger to say, go do the thing with Oslo Guide. Once we've done that, we can do it as a, a one-shot in utterance like this, where I say, ask Oslo Guide to recommend an attraction. Or I can break it into chunks, um, where I could say, Alexa, open Oslo Guide. And it says, welcome to Oslo Guide. And then I say, recommend an attraction. Both of these situations are exactly the same. They do the same thing. They end up in the same place in your code. So there's no difference to Alexa. Um, one takes one step, one takes two steps, but ultimately the, the user will end up in the same place. It's whatever they're comfortable with. I should mention there's a couple of rules, and we'll get into a lot of this stuff tomorrow in the workshop if you really want to know the, the nitty gritty about a lot of this. But you can see here I have the word Oslo Guide as my invocation name. This is like the name of your app, the name of your skill. And so there's a couple of rules about this. One is, unless you own the word, you own the copyright or the trademark or the whatever it is about that word, um, you have to use at least two words in the name of your skill. So if you are Uber, you could just say, our skill name is Uber, and we can do that because they own the word. Um, but I can't go in and name a skill. I don't know what a good example of that would be. Just guide, let's say. I couldn't just say, ask guide to do a thing. Guide has to have a second word of some kind um, in order to be a valid invocation name for people. Um, I'm also not allowed to um, infringe on any IP, so I can't name my skill Star Wars as much as I would really love to um, because they have more lawyers than I do. Uh, and then finally, you can't use words like ask or play or things like that because those are reserved words that are already being used. Um, and this all gets validated in the interface for you, so it's not anything you need to worry about, like what are the reserved words. It's a pretty minimal list, but you can't use um, connector words like the or to or an. Um, those kinds of things are not part of an invocation name. It's just things like Oslo Guide or Games Back or I'm building a skill called TKO Trivia, right? All of those kinds of things are, are totally fine to use. So you can do recommend an attraction, but ultimately what that funnels down to is I have an attraction intent, and that is a thing in my code that will go do a thing. Um, I can also build this concept called slots into my utterances so that instead of having to build a sample utterance that's within one miles, within two miles, within three miles, within four miles, uh, what I can do instead is just identify that this value right here, if somebody says something like recommend an attraction within four miles, I can say that four is a slot, and whatever they say in there, I'm expecting a number. But as, whatever they say, it doesn't really matter what it is. If they say I'm recommending uh, recommend an attraction within pizza miles, there's a chance that I might actually get the word pizza into my skill, and I'd have to figure out how to use that. Um, but for most cases, they're going to use it appropriately and say, oh, I want something within five miles of my house or, or four kilometers or what, you know, whatever you've built your skill to do. But it captures that value for you, returns that to your code, and then you can take some action on that. So my baseball skill, I asked it about a team. It returned to me the name of the team so that I could call my API, look up the data that was necessary, come back and give you a response. If I don't know what they said, I can't help them take any action. But again, this falls into the attraction intent where I have a slot value called distance, and it actually gives me the number four. Now, that, that might not seem like magic. The user said four. Of course, I get the number four. Um, but there are some other slots that have some real magical powers to them. Uh, one is a slot we call the date slot. And if you have a date slot in it, like uh, tell me what my calendar looks like tomorrow, 
what I get in my code is not the word tomorrow. What I get instead is the actual date of tomorrow so that I can take that date object and use it in my code. But they can also say next Tuesday or next week or at the end of the month. And those things will also translate down to a specific date for you. Uh, and you just get the date and you can take action on what that thing is. So it allows the user to specify the way they would talk, but it takes that date, figures out what the actual date would be, and, and hands that to you. Um, we also do that with, uh, with things like numbers. Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of other kind of built-in slot uh, offerings that we have that cover some of those data type values. So as you can see, though, as I mentioned earlier, we define a list of utterances. This is not a master list by any means. Um, this is a list of a representative sample. And this is one of the things that I had the hardest time getting over when I started building software for voice, was the idea that everything is kind of gray and fuzzy. Um, I don't have to have a list of every possible thing anyone might ever say. That would be a job all unto itself. I would never be done writing that list of things. But what I can do is create a list of utterances that's maybe 7, 10, 12 things long. And that list is representative enough to cover most of the cases for someone to say, hello, or hi, or what's up. Those are all really just hello intent type words. And so I provided a list of seven or 12 examples. And those all funnel down to my hello intent. So you can see here that this is our, our developer interface, if you were using our, our developer console. Um, and you can see here that I have, let's see if I can use my mouse to point to stuff, because it's too hard to do that. Um, you can see here that I have a list of my intents on the left-hand side. So I have one that's an attraction intent. We've kind of talked about that a little bit. But I also have a breakfast intent, a coffee intent, a dinner intent. And you can see that attraction intent has a slot value called distance. And so these are my utterances here. Give me an activity within distance miles. Or they might just say, give me an activity without any indication of what the distance might be. And if that's the case, then you don't have to use that as a filter on whatever data you're going to bring back to them. Um, you can see that I also have recommend an attraction within distance. And I've defined that as Amazon.number, so I'm telling it, like, hey, this is specifically going to be a number. I want this to be the thing um, that comes back to me. So this is what it looks like. I have an attraction intent, I have some utterances defined for it, and I have one slot called distance. But I can also do things with values that aren't a, a really nice, clean set of data like a number. Um, what about if the user says, I don't want an attraction, I want specifically, I want to go golfing. Well, there isn't a magic list of activities, um, so we create our own. We create our own slot value, and we say golfing might be one of the things, but maybe it's also kayaking or binge watching or whatever it is. And we have a whole list of activities, and then those activities, when the user says one of those things or something that looks like those things, then that value comes through in our activity slot. And you can see in this case that I have that same attraction intent, but now I have tell me about activity within distance miles. I have a second slot over here that is activity, and I have a type called activity type. Oh, I thought I had another slide there to show um, what's inside of that. But the idea is that I could fill activity type with all of the types of activities that I would expect my users to describe. So there might be going to the movies, or kayaking, or swimming, or bicycling. Um, all of those things would be our activities, right? So we're back to this picture. We're now in our code where we can literally do anything we want. Um, this is, there's no restrictions here. We, all we've done is define an endpoint that has some functions. But all we're doing is passing a JSON file in to say, hey, this is what the user wanted to do. It is up to you, and it's in your full control, to do whatever you need to do here. If you need to call out to a, a web service, Call the web service, get a response back, talk to the user. Um, if you need to save some stuff to a database, save some stuff to a database. Uh, but a lot of people get hung up on here, like what, can I, what am I allowed to do, what can I? Literally anything you can do with code, you are allowed to do. Although I don't recommend like asking Alexa to start a denial of service attack or something like that. I suppose you could build a skill to do that. Um, the general idea is to be able to, in your code, do all the things that you would normally do, right? talk to databases, pull data from services, um, crunch numbers, write files, do all the stuff you would normally do. Uh, and then when you're done with it, you're going to compile a new JSON document that's going to get passed back to the user uh, through one of two ways. The first is through the audio, right? So we're going to actually give a response to the user and say, here's what I found out, or here's what standings are for your baseball team. But we also have visual ways. I was going to show you a quick example of this here. 
Um, anyone that has an Alexa device has the Amazon Alexa app. And in the app, um, there's this concept called cards. I can write visual information to the app. This is the app running in my browser, but it's the same app that I would run uh, on my phone. And you can see here that I asked it about the Cleveland Indians earlier. And you can see that it's showing me exactly what it said. It even shows me what it heard me say. Um, and I don't, I, I'll turn my volume up a little bit, but I don't think it's uh, coming through the speakers. The Indians. But that's actually my voice. It saved my recording into the cloud. I, I have the ability to go delete all of this stuff if I don't want it to be persisted. Um, but it, I, I can hear exactly what it heard. So as I'm building and I'm testing, this is a really valuable thing to know. Like, what did it hear me say? Because this is, this is writing down the words that it heard me say, but I can also then replay that audio for myself to say, oh, that's why. But this is only data that I have generated. I don't get to see like other users' um, data, anything like this. This is just my own. Uh, but you can see that as I go through here, I have a trivia game that I'm working on. And I'm actually posting the question as I ask it. And if they get the answer right, then I will post a picture with the answer that they got correct. Um, and I can, I can show you a quick example of this. Alexa. Alexa, open TKO Trivia. Welcome back to TKO Trivia, Jeff Blankenberg. You can ask me for a random question, or you can start a quiz. What would you like to do now? Give me a random question. Here is your question from the category, technology. On a standard US keyboard, the dollar sign is typed by pressing shift plus what key? Does anyone know? You said no. This is, like, this is a thing we should all know, right? We use a keyboard every day. Does anyone know? I heard five. That's wrong. It's I heard you say a thing we should all know right every day. Alexa, Does anyone know? stop. Uh, the answer is four. The dollar sign is over the four uh, on a keyboard, which I guess in this case would be the euro. Um, uh, do you, you, know, you guys use the Corona. I haven't seen a Norwegian keyboard. Does it have a different key? Anyone? It's a dollar sign still? OK. Um, so in that case, this is me asking the question. And if I'd gotten it right, it would write um, a photo into this feed as well. But this is just a continuous feed of things that I have asked it for. There's a, that, that's what it would look like if I'd gotten the question right. Um, and we can continue on forever. So this is all of my devices. So as my family uses this at home, um, it's also possible that I'll see like songs that they've listened to and all that. Because all of these are responses. But these are all things that are written by my skills into my feed. OK. So let's talk about development tools, and we're going to dive into that a little bit. So the first one um, I can show you here very briefly. You don't need a device at all to develop for Alexa. There's a really great tool out on the web called EchoSim. EchoSim.io is the website for it. Um, and all you do is log in with your Amazon credentials, and boom, you have an Alexa device in your browser that you can use. There are other tools out there as well, but I, I think this one works fantastic. Um, and it's the one that I use when I don't have a device around um, to play with. Now, I don't have my audio turned up on this, but all you do is hold this button down, talk, and let go, and it, it'll execute that command for you. The other piece is the developer portal, which we've talked about a little bit. And then I also have the CLI. So we have a full command line interface that allows us to build skills just from the command line as well. So I can do things like, uh, let me get out of this directory. Um, I can do ask new. And it says, what do you want your skill name to be? I could say um, NDC. And it's created a new folder for me called NDC. Uh, and in here, I have things like a, my Lambda function, which is all the code that my back end runs. Uh, I have my model file. So if I open, if I open this, um, now I'm set up to write skills uh, by default for U United States. But that would be different, of course, depending on where you're located. But you can see that it gives me automatically this JSON file. I'll lower this a little bit, um, where I have my invocation name defined. I have my individual intents. So I have cancel, help, and stop, uh, as, as well as a hello world intent. And then these are my sample utterances that apply to my hello world intent. Now, this is a very simplified example. If you want to see something a little more complex, we can look at um, my trivia game that I'm building, which looks more like this one. And you can see here that I have TKO Trivia as my invocation name. But I also have cancel, help, stop, yes, no, fallback, answer intent. Um, I have a start quiz intent. I have quiz rules, monetization. Uh, these monetization and debug intent 
These are actually me being really lazy. Um, I built actual voice commands to be able to turn debugging on and off inside my skill, as well as whether or not the stuff in my, my skill actually costs money right now or not. I'll turn this off before I would push it to production, but right now it's really nice to be able to get past the paywalls without having to like re resubmit my code, re-upload it, and do all that. So I just built some intents to handle that. Um, setting my team name, questions, all that. And then I also have these slots. So you saw with the, uh, the answer intent. Yeah, this is my answer intent here. If the user says something like, I think the answer is this, or maybe they just say just the answer itself without any wrapper words, um, I have a slot way down here called answer. And in it, I have all of my values. So this, this is uh, kind of wrapping not so nicely. But they, they normally look like this. And I have some synonyms here for like Jackson Pollock or the, the uh, artist's last name, just Pollock, if that was what you answered with. In either of those cases, if you say any of those things, then I, I get this ID value back. This is just a trick that I'm playing. But it allows me to say, oh, you, you answered the appropriate question. And then I match those two things together and say, ta-da, you got the answer right or wrong. Um, but all of these represent um, slot values. So if I zoom in a little bit more so it's readable, you can see like Frank Lloyd Wright is an answer, Matt Groening, who created The Simpsons, is an answer, tap dancing, like it's just all over the board. But all of these are individual values in one slot. And if you say any of those words, um, I'm going to say, oh, I got a match, but it doesn't match the question that I asked you, or it does. And I match those two things together and say, oh, you got the question right or wrong. So that's how this works. And then at the very bottom, I also have a whole list of all of my categories um, that I call category, not surprisingly. And there are things like art and stage, and geography, and history, and language. And this is so people can ask for questions from a specific category. So this is what a, a, like a bigger real skill looks like. Um, but ultimately, all of that I'm just doing through the Ask CLI. And all of the code that I'm writing is using our SDK. So the SDK, again, is not a necessary thing. Uh, but if you're getting started, I think it makes things a lot easier. To at least to get started with and to understand some concepts. Um, it's available on, on Node uh, through NPM. So you can just go out and grab this thing and pull it down. Um, and this is what the code that you would write against our SDK looks like. So again, I mentioned that you get a JSON file that is um, handed to your backend, your service. And the first thing that we do is look through that file. You can see here that I have handler handlerinput.requestenvelope.request.type. And I'm checking to see, is it an intent request? And then I'm also checking to say, OK, cool, it's an intent request. But is it the help intent? And if it is, this can handle function returns the value true. I don't know if you're all familiar with JavaScript, but uh, I'm doing this all in JavaScript. You don't have to. There are other languages. We have other SDKs. Um, but here, here's my perspective on JavaScript. Anyone that's a software developer, at some point in their career, whether they wanted to or not, has had to write some JavaScript. Uh, and so I feel like this is a good demonstration language for everybody, because you've at least seen this. Uh, and it's readable, where if you sit down with something like Ruby and you've never seen Ruby before, or Python, those look a little different. They're a little harder to follow. Once you know those languages, I think they're, they're fantastic. Um, but I think that JavaScript is a really good learning language um, as we go through this. So I have a can handle function that is checking, is it the help intent? And if it is, then my handle function runs. And in the handle function, I write out a variable and I say, this is a trivia game. For now, you can ask a random question. And then I return this object, this response builder object. Um, and what I do first is I have uh, a method called speak, where I pass it in that text. This is a trivia game. And then I have another method called reprompt. And this one allows me to pass a different thing. Uh, and I, I'm going to come down the stairs. We're going to come into the crowd a little bit, because this is kind of fun, um, without falling. So I need you to do nothing. Just sit there and stare at me. It's perfect. Um, but the example I want to show you guys Standing in front of a speaker with a microphone is not always a good idea. Um, if I were to try to have a conversation with you and I say, hey, what's the weather out like outside? And he just stares at me for about eight seconds. It's likely that I'm going to turn to him and say, no, seriously, like, do I need a raincoat, an umbrella? I need something to go outside probably, right? And he stares at me for another eight seconds. I think you would all agree we're done having a conversation, right? We're, we are not communicating in any way. Uh, and because of that, that's exactly how Alexa is set up as well. So the first thing that we do is we offer a speak command. So the user has said something to Alexa. The speak is what Alexa says back. And in this case, it's this is a trivia game on and off. Reprompt could be something totally different. And it's only ever heard if the user doesn't say something in that first eight seconds. I can show you that very quickly. Alexa, open games back. 
can tell you how many games back your favorite baseball team is. Which team would you like to know about? Which team would you like to know about? Stop. Goodbye. So in that example, I said nothing. And after eight seconds, Alexa comes back in and says something else. Um, if I don't say anything after that next eight seconds, Alexa stops the skill. That is the end of the conversation. In order for me to continue doing whatever I was trying to do, I have to open that skill again. That's important to understand because, at one, that leads to the microphone not being open all the time, which would be bad. Um, but it also allows us to give the user a little bit of time um, so that they don't, they're not rushed to give their answer, and if they don't, they're kind of stuck. So by providing a reprompt, this also is what allows the microphone to be opened. If I eliminate that reprompt line and I just go from speak to get response, what will end up happening is that Alexa will respond, but the microphone will never open. So it's as if she's just telling me something and then we're done having a conversation, which is good, but that feels much more like talking to a computer, um, which I don't, I don't like that feeling. I want to feel like there's just someone in my house that's always able and uh, capable of responding to my questions. And so with my questions should also come the ability to follow up and ask more information or ask something else. Um, and so that's what a reprompt allows us to do, is to open that microphone and continue the conversation with our user. So the last thing that we're going to do here is talk about how we get the response back to our user. So I mentioned that we go through the audio and the visual, but how we actually do that is pretty cool. Um, the first is, of course, text-to-speech, which you've heard plenty of so far. It's just me providing a string of text and Alexa taking that text and speaking it back to the user. Uh, but there's also this concept of SSML. Um, this is a markup language. It looks a lot like HTML. Um, but the idea here is I can mark up the text that I hand to Alexa so that it is pronounced differently. Um, I can add sound effects or audio files inside my, um, my SSML. There's a lot of very cool things that I can do with it. I'm going to show you a couple examples of this. So the first one that's kind of fun um, is an idea that we call speech cons. Uh, I like to think of it like an icon for your ear, right? It's an it's a audible set of word or something like that that is um, more emphatic. So Alexa will say it with a little more emotion. Uh, so I think the best way is just to demonstrate a couple of these. Uh, the skill that I'm going to use is one that's available to anyone. It's called Dev Tips. Uh, this is a skill that I've been working on for about a year. And the idea is it's meant to answer questions uh, for people that are building skills. And so it covers all the topics you would generally want to know about for Alexa development. And um, in all those cases, we try to continue to grow it and modify it so that people have the answers that they need. So one of the things that we added was SpeechCon. So I can just ask it, and it'll give me a random SpeechCon. Alexa, open DevTips. Hello. What topic can I assist with? Play a SpeechCon. Here's a SpeechCon you might like. Kerchu. Which other topic can I assist with? Play a speech con. I found a good speech con for you. Swoosh. What do you want to know about? Stop. So there's a, whole, there's a whole bunch of those. I think uh, in the English language, there's just, just under 200. Uh, in Australia, I think there's 230 or something. I don't know why they get a bunch of extras. Uh, but there are about kangaroos and stuff like that, I guess. So um, the idea here is that there are all these really emphatic terms and words that all you have to do is wrap in a little tag, and boom, she will say it with extra emphasis. Now, it doesn't apply to all words. You have to use one of the specific set of 100 or 200 words. So SSML isn't just that, though. It really does allow you to do all sorts of cool things. Um, I mentioned that you can do sound effects, but you could replace the entirety of the audio of your skill um, just with audio files. So there's, there's two things I want to show you here. The first is I have a, I have a skill that I um, built only because I was going to speak to Disney, like corporate Disney, um, about building skills. And I wanted to show them something that I thought would catch their attention. So I built a skill that allowed me to have a conversation with Kylo Ren. Are you guys all familiar with Kylo Ren? He's a bad guy in the, the latest Star Wars movies. Um, so I, I ripped some audio off the DVD, and I pulled it into a, um, a online storage, and then I'm using those as the audio files in my skill instead. And so it sounds like this. Alexa, open Kylo Ren. Where is it? Where is what? You know what I'm calling. The map to Skywalker. 
I have no idea what you're talking about. That's it. That's my entire performance. Um, but the, uh, the idea, thank you, thank you, thank you. So the idea there is that you can replace, th those are just responses the same way that we've been doing everything else. But instead of providing text to speech, I provided an audio file, an MP3. Um, and it was able to play that in place of my speech. There's an entire game, it's called uh, Lie Swatter, that does this. They, they hired a guy that is a, he sounds like a game show host. Um, and he, there's an entire game. I won't play the entire game, but I'll let you hear what this sounds like. Alexa, open Lie Swatter. Hi, welcome to Lie Swatter, the true or false trivia game from Jackbox Games. I'm going to share seven statements. After each, say truth or lie. Let's get started. A Boston University study found that Coca-Cola is a spermicide. Stop. Uh, Until next time, goodbye. But you can see there that they used some other guy's voice to do their entire skill. Um, they, that meant that they had to have him sit down in the studio and record every possible thing that would be said during the skill, including all the answers to their questions, all the questions themselves. Um, all, it's a lot of work, but you can definitely put your own flavor and taste on a skill uh, by doing that. So that's SSML. Um, we also have things like pauses where you can add a break. So you want to add a dramatic pause to what Alexa's saying. Um, you can do things like interjection. This is what it would look like to do one of those speech cons. Use, it's called an interjection. Um, you can also use a concept called prosody, which allows you to modify things like speed and pitch and volume. So if you want Alexa to say a couple of words louder, just wrap it in a prosody tag and say the, the volume's gonna be higher and boom, it'll be louder. Um, and then audio clips, that's how I did the Kylo Ren example. But so I have a couple of design principles I wanna leave you guys with here because I think this is the, the most important part of thinking about building for voice is what are the right ways to do things? Because it, it is very different from how we think about mobile and web. So the key things are to think about voice first always. I know I said we could write cards and there are devices that have screens on them, but those should all be bonus extra content. It should never be required that a user has to touch a device or has to see a thing. It should all be done with voice. Cognitive load is something we want to avoid. Um, it's very easy if I were to list off 15 ice cream flavors for you and say which one's your favorite, that's hard. If you've ever called your bank or your insurance company, you know what it's like to go through a touch tone system and try to, okay, do I want option four or do I want option seven? I, I don't know. And once you make that choice, do you know the easiest way to get from option seven to option four? Hang up and call again, right? That's the easiest way to reset. So we want to make sure we're eliminating that cognitive load. So here they are. Build skills that have a clear purpose. You should do one thing like games back. It should do one really focused thing. Don't try to be all the things. Try to be the thing that you're focused in on. Uh, the second, make your skills discoverable. Use names that are obvious. I was building another trivia style game um, that is, uh, the idea is I give you three clues and then you have to figure out what those three things have in common. Um, and I came up, I was working all these names that use the letters T-R-I, like tri, like tricycle or something like that, that would be um, some cool, unique name, like I would do with a domain name or an app or something. Um, but what I realized is I kept saying three clues over and over and over in the, in the skill, and I was beating home the name of my skill without realizing it, and so I ended up calling it three clues. It's really obvious and, and clear, um, and it's easy for people to remember, and I think that's the really core part of this, is that you don't have an icon on their phone, you don't have something on their desktop of their computer, you only have their memory. If they don't remember what your skill is called, if they don't remember how to use it, it becomes very hard to be able to remember and come back to it the next time. There's a great uh, adventure game called The Magic Door, and he promotes all the time talking about the idea of open the magic door. And that's a really co easy concept to remember, so when you wanna come back the next time, you just say, open the magic door, and it, and it does. Design for natural language conversation. I kinda hinted at this earlier, but the idea really is you wanna let users say whatever they want to say. Don't force them into a specific um, sentence structure or a pattern that they have to follow to communicate with you. Use good interaction design principles. So still think about what is it like to do a give and take between a user um, and the device? Um, what does interaction look like? How do we think about patterning all that? We have an entire interaction design guide that you're happy to, you're welcome to review online. Um, we'll talk about that a little more tomorrow. 
You should handle the unexpected gracefully. I have a quick example of this. Alexa, ask Games Back about Pizza Mouse. There are two teams called the Sots. Uh, Which team did you want? Pizza Mouse. Did you want the white socks or mm. the red socks? Alexa, stop. Goodbye. So there was a time at which that worked, but I have fumbled with that code enough that I think I broke the thing I was trying to demo. Um, but what it should say is, oh, Pizza Mouse isn't a baseball team that I recognize. You should ask me about one of the actual baseball teams. Right? I still handle the thing that I wasn't expecting, and I do it in a way that doesn't just make it feel like it's broken. Now, the final one, the final two, is you should always take an opportunity to beta test and watch people use your skill. You would be amazed. We as developers are very, very arrogant, and we think we know everything. We, we know how a user is going to talk to our skill. We know the words they're going to say. Uh, you're all wrong. I'm wrong. Um, what we found consistently is that even though you think you've nailed down like, the way someone's going to approach a problem, more often than not, there's a 100 other ways you haven't even considered on how they might speak those things or how they might want to accomplish that task. So really, really get in front of users and understand how they're talking to it. And then finally, simulate human speech as much, much as possible. This, there's two pieces to this. The first is be randomized. Um, it feels weird to say that in software, like give them an inconsistent interface. But you really want to do that. If, if there's a time when you're a travel agent skill and you want to ask them where they're flying to, where they're flying from, and the date, you don't have to ask them in the same order every time. You don't have to ask those things in the same, with the same words every time. By using different words in different orders, it forces the user to pay attention. And you guys have all tried to listen to a podcast while working. It's hard, right? You can't pay attention to the thing and also write a bunch of code or um, surf the web or do whatever. It's, they're two disparate tasks. And so by forcing me to listen, by forcing me to pay attention because I don't know what the words are going to be, uh, it makes it much more natural for the user like they're having a conversation with a person. So I was going to get into this a little bit. Um, I know we're really close on time here. Um, to build a skill costs $0, 0 euro, 0 kronen, whatever your currency happens to be. Um, to build a skill, um, the entire front end is, is and will always be free. If you use AWS, I know a lot of people see cloud service and they think, oh, I can't get into that. That's going to be expensive. Um, using AWS Lambda um, is incredibly, incredibly cheap. The first million times your code is run every month is free. And if any of you build a skill that has more than a million uses in one month, call me, email me, Twitter me. I will fly back and I will take you out for the nicest dinner you've ever had because you earned it. That's an amazing accomplishment. Um, if you do exceed that million, though, I think the second million is like five US dollars. It's not a lot of money. Um, and on top of that, we have this promotional credits program that allows you to get $100 in AWS credits every month for free once you've published one skill. Um, and you can use those $100 however you want across AWS. So if you want to spin up some VMs or set up a database or do whatever, you can, you can use those for that. So, uh, Alexa for Business is another cool thing I think you should check out if, you, if you're thinking about Alexa in the enterprise. Uh, monetization is a brand new thing that allows you to sell digital things inside your skills or physical um, goods and services outside of your skill. Um, and then obviously we're growing. We're trying to get to as many countries as we can. Everywhere Amazon is is where we want Alexa to be. There's also a very cool new concept called gadgets. Uh, we have these cool things that are uh, Alexa buttons. So you can build interactive trivia games where people actually ring in. Um, I saw some people build one where it's, it's kind of like Simon, but the buttons, um, the colors change on the buttons. You have to actually remember the color order and not just the location as you play things like that. Um, and then if you're going to take a picture of a slide, this is probably the one to take a picture of. Um, these are a bunch of great resources to check out about getting started and how to move forward in building a skill for Alexa. So I'll leave this up for just a second, but I literally have one minute left. I'm more than happy to take questions after because I think we have about a 20-minute break. Um, but I'll leave you, if you're going to take one URL, this is the one. This is the place where all the resources, links, everything you're going to need to get started. This is where it is. Um, my Twitter is up here as well. Um, I would give you my email address, but it would get lost in the waterfall that is Amazon's email system. So if you want to get a hold of me and have a real conversation about building skills or whatever, we are all over the place. I'm on Twitter. Um, there's a, a website called Twitch where we do live streaming probably three, four hours a day of live coding and question answering and office hours and all sorts of stuff. So we're, we're here to help. Uh, and if there's anything we can do to help you build your next skill, we're, we're more than happy to do that. But right at one hour, I thank you all for listening and tuning in. Thank you so much.
we have, we have a couple of minutes of time. Is there any questions? I covered it all perfectly? Oh, okay. Yes. That's a great question. So the, the question is, I mentioned that we persist all of the audio files that are recorded from a user. Uh, they are saved in the AWS cloud. Um, they're anonymized so that we don't know whose they are. Um, it's, it's all just like long strings of, uh, of characters. Um, the user has the ability to delete all of those anytime they want. So if you want to go in, you can go to your Amazon account and say, I want all of my recordings el eliminated, or I just want this one and this one. That's totally fine. You can do that. Um, but the user completely controls that, um, being able to eliminate uh, connection to that, to that data anymore. Anybody else? Yeah. That's a great question. The question is about authentication with existing services. So I mentioned Uber. Uber does exactly this. You have an Uber account on your app. You have um, on the web. All that stuff already exists. I have an account. I have my credit card information. I have my address. All of that lives uh, on the Uber ecosystem. Nothing to do with Alexa at all. Um, what they do on the skill is they require something we call account linking, which is basically just an OAuth connection. Uh, so they, they give a token to the skill. The skill now has the ability to act on your behalf and make those kind, same kinds of transactions against their API that you would do from the app or anywhere else. Uh, but it's just, it's just done through account linking, so anything you can set up with OAuth should be able to handle it. But um, I, know, uh, I don't know if you guys have Domino's Pizza here, but Domino's Pizza is a big proponent of that. Um, Uber, there's lots of others um, that do that kind of thing. Starbucks does it, so you can actually order your coffee before you head to the store. Um, lots of cool stuff like that. But yeah, it's just using OAuth uh, account linking. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. So he he mentioned he's asking about um, two names having the two skills having the same name, perhaps. Um, the the names of skills don't work like they do with like domain names, where only one person can own it. Um, in fact, there's several hundred cat fact skills uh, where people have just taken our base fact template that I'm going to show tomorrow, um, applied a bunch of cat facts to it, and published it. Uh, we, give, we give something free away every month, so a lot of times people will do that just to get a free T-shirt or hoodie or something. Um, but the idea behind um, name collisions is on each individual user's account, they enable skills. And so I'll have this cat facts skill is the one that I really like, so I enabled that on my account. And when I say open cat facts, it's going to open the one that I chose, where someone else might have a different one, and they'll open that one when they say open cat facts. If I were to somehow enable two skills that had the same invocation name, Whichever one I enabled first is the one that will respond, and the other one will just kind of live in the dust. Um, I'll never actually get to use it. But if I were to disable that first one, then the, the second one would automatically be the one that starts getting used. Um, so it's on a user-by-user -user basis is where that, that conflict is managed. Anybody else? Yeah. This is a setup question from Heather down here. She wants to know, is there a way to say, like, when I asked for the weather, I wanted to use this skill. Uh, today, there is not a way to define or, or manage that. Um, we, we did announce some programs that allow us, uh, we have this thing called a uh, can handle concept, where a user can say, oh, you know what, if it's a weather request, I can do that. I can handle anything related to the weather, and I can subscribe to these kinds of things which puts you in a specific bucket once that's validated so that when people ask for the weather, they don't always get the first party experience, but instead it gets filtered across anybody that could handle that experience instead. Um, and then people can say, oh, you know what? I really liked how that one worked. I'm going to continue to use that one instead of the default, for example. Uh, but thank you for the question. Uh, anyone else? Um, I'm happy to answer questions privately. If you're too embarrassed to ask, that's fine. Uh, and again, like I mentioned, tomorrow morning, uh, we have a two-hour workshop where we're going to work through actually building a skill. So I'd, I'd be happy to see any of you there tomorrow. All right, thank you.